All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, all you magnificent melon heads out there. Today is Wednesday, October 4th, 2023. We got some news this morning. We got jobs data from ADP. And we got some mortgage information from the Mortgage Bankers Association of America. None of it was particularly good. Or if you're a Fed watcher and you're hoping for bad news so that the Fed might ease off, well, then I guess this might have been some good news for you. Because private payrolls, according to ADP, came in at just 89,000 jobs added in the United States. That's versus 153,000 that were expected. A huge miss for ADP private payrolls. Now, I got to put an asterisk on that one because ADP private payrolls often differs wildly from the Bureau of Labor Statistics non-farm payrolls report that comes out on Friday. That is the jobs number that we get on Friday, and that gets much more attention. That tends to move markets more. ADP, usually there's big differences between the two, but at least directionally, they tend to be in agreement. So to see a big drop in ADP obviously is a bad portent about what we might see in the jobs number on Friday. Not carved in stone. It doesn't mean we automatically get a bad jobs number on Friday, especially considering that JOLTS report or job openings and labor turnover survey that we got yesterday that showed job openings in the United States rose rather substantially last month. So those two data points are somewhat in conflict. But if you're the Fed watcher, we got a weaker jobs market and one data point suggesting a weaker jobs market today. And that might give the Fed a little bit more flexibility about that November rate hike, which my personal opinion is still that we are going to get that rate hike in November, even though we've seen this monster move in interest rates these last few days. A move that's taking a breather today. Rates are down just a little bit. Seem they hit a peak. We hit a peak of, what, 4.88 in the middle of the night on the 10-year Treasury. That is down now into the high 4.7 range, luckily. But rates have just been rising astronomically these past few weeks, really ever since Jerome Powell's press conference at the September FOMC. And speaking of those interest rates, we also got some mortgage data from the Mortgage Bankers Association today. Demand for mortgages has dropped to its lowest level since 1996. I was 16 years old with other priorities back then, the last time mortgage demand was so low. These higher interest rates are just stifling the housing market. They are smothering home buyers. And miraculously, for whatever reason, supply demand dynamics, a lack of inventory, home prices are just still not moving down. Is this one of these situations where Home prices aren't moving down, they're not moving down, they're not moving down, and then all of a sudden they all just puke lower. Or are the housing bulls right and home prices are going to stay here because we haven't built enough homes to keep up with the demand, to keep up with population expansion? Let me know in the comments, are there any housing bulls left out there? I, I'm sure there's a few of you guys. Me, I'm not a housing bull which also means I have been wrong about the housing market thus far because the home prices still haven't come down despite this surge in unaffordability. And unaffordability is still getting worse. 7.5%, the average mortgage rate in the United States, according to the NBA data released today, that's the average from last week. Next week's number is going to be even higher, guys. It's going to be even higher. These interest rates just keep going up. And speaking of interest rates, we found something interesting Going on in the mortgage-backed securities market, I've got Kirian Von Hest, a.k.a. Deso Games, coming on the channel later today to talk about something he found, an incredible find that Kirian Von Hest made, something he, he looks in places of the market, corners of the market that nobody else looks, and he stumbled on something very important yesterday, something that changed in the market very quietly to very little fanfare. And with that, I think it's time to shrink my big melon of a head and let's see what's going on in markets. While we're shrinking me, guys, please hit that like button. It really does help the YouTube algorithm. Helps to get this message out. And if you're new here, hit that subscribe button. We do this every morning. Have your coffee with the melon heads while we go through markets. The CNN Fear Greed Index remains in extreme greed, not greed, in extreme fear territory down at just 17 way, way down into the depths of the extreme greed territory. But stocks this morning, not doing so bad. It was a bloodbath in the stock market yesterday. 
They're catching a little bit of a bounce this morning. Not much. We've got the S&P futures are up 10 points pre-market, about a quarter of 1%. We've got the Dow is up 52 points pre-market, 0.16% into the green area. And the NASDAQ is up 61 points or 0.42%. Now let's talk about stocks for a minute because we had something interesting happening in Congress yesterday. And I don't want to get too political, guys. Politics just brings out the worst in people. But Speaker McCarthy was ousted yesterday in Congress. And in my my opinion, my interpretation, what happened yesterday was really a war between the stock market and the bond market. Uh, maybe I'm extrapolating a little too much here, but let me just talk about why. Because the debt spending, the reckless, just randomly dumping bonds onto the market because we need to borrow more money, spending that money into the economy to create the illusion of economic growth. That's artificially inflating economic activity. It's artificially inflating the earnings of publicly traded companies. So government debt spending is really the only economic growth that this economy has right now. Now, if Speaker McCarthy ends up being replaced by a deficit hawk, that means that we're going to get more, more gridlock in Congress. We're going to get less deficit spending. We're going to have more government shutdowns, more debt ceiling fiascos in the future. Now, that would be very bad for stocks, obviously, because it means less reckless government spending into the economy in order to artificially inflate company earnings. But it might actually be very good for the bond market because it might mean we're going to slow down this issuance of treasuries, this supply of bonds. And so if the supply goes down, maybe the price of the bonds would go higher and the interest rates would come back down. So this change from, from McCarthy to assuming we get a budget hawk, that's not a safe assumption. But if we get a budget hawk in his place, and it means more congressional gridlock, and it means less government spending, then that might be saving the bond market at the expense of the stock market. I had a lot of questions about that. I put it out on Twitter yesterday. That's just my hot take on the subject. Again, we'll see who replaces McCarthy. It might just be you know another schmuck who just comes in and rubber stamps trillion-dollar spending bills. We'll see what happens. Look it over at the commodities market. We got gold is a little bit higher this morning, 55 cents higher on December gold futures trading at 1,842. December silver futures at 2144. That's up about six cents this morning or 0.29%. West Texas intermediate crude November futures are trading at 87.48. We're getting a little bit of a pullback in oil here down $1.75. That's almost 2% lower. I am looking for a buying opportunity for crude here in the low 80s. We'll see if we get it. Moving on to the DXY, we got the Dixies taking a breather today, getting slammed down by about 43 basis points at 106.57. Looked like we may have had some Japanese intervention in the Forex market yesterday. We're still not sure. A lot of people are debating whether the BOJ intervened or not. We'll talk about that in just a minute, but that could be an explanation for why the dollar is weakening at the moment. Looking over at the bond market, we got yields are taking a break this morning. The 30 years down eight basis points to 486 this bond market was overdue for a correction here, guys. Yields have been just so much higher. Remember, yields heading lower. That is bond prices heading higher. So really, this could just be a dead cat bounce in the bond market. We've got the 10-year yield is down 6.5 basis points, or 4.73. And the two-year is at 5.09. That's down 5.5 basis points this morning. And the one-month is still sitting pretty at 5.388. Now, here's the top story this morning. ADP employment change. Private businesses in the U.S. hired 89,000 workers in September. That is the least since January of 2021 when private employers shed jobs and well below market forecasts of 153,000. This was not a little miss in the ADP number. This was a huge miss in this number. It follows a revised 180,000 increase in August compared to an initial 177. The services sector added 81,000 jobs, namely financial activities added 17,000. That's interesting. And education, health services added 10,000. Construction also added 16,000 jobs, but losses were seen in professional and business services down 32,000. Check out WeWork, by the way, put a pin in that one. Trade, transportation, and utilities shed 13,000 and manufacturing dropped by 12,000. Large establishments drove the slowdown, losing 83,000 jobs and wiping out gains they made in August. Meanwhile, annual wage growth slowed to 5.9%. That's the 12th consecutive monthly decline. Now, that last sentence there is a little confusing. Annual wage growth slowed to 5.9%. So wages are still rising. They're just rising at a slower rate. So when they say the 12th consecutive monthly decline, 
That means the wages are still going up, but they have been going up at a slower rate month over month for 12 months in a row now. So still a little bit of inflation seen in the wage market, but it is slowing. Okay, and now this is in kind of contrast to what we saw yesterday. This is United States job openings or the JOLTS report. The number of job openings in the U.S. rose by 690,000 from the previous month to 9.61 million in August of 2023, well above market consensus for 8.8 million and indicating a robust labor market despite the Fed's unprecedented monetary policy tightening. So this is the JOLTS report. This is the number of job openings in the U.S. Remember the Great Resignation. There was millions upon millions. That number was dropping pretty much for the last year. It's been coming down. We were as low as 8.9 million last month. Now we got another spike up. Is this just another dead cat bounce on our way up? Or is the labor market still tight? I have held the position that I think this tightness in the labor market has been fake all along, mainly because wage growth has not kept pace with inflation for all but the most recent few months. You know, labor getting cheaper relative to everything else, that's not a sign of a tight labor market. That's a sign of a very weak labor market. So I'm not looking too much into this JOLTS report from yesterday. And also this one was a big story this morning. Mortgage demand drops to the lowest level since 1996 as interest rates head toward 8%. Said it yesterday, guys, 8% mortgage rates are coming. And here it is this morning in CNBC. You know, think about your house. Think about your payment, your mortgage right now. You're probably one of those guys who locked in a lower mortgage rate around three, three and a half, maybe even two and a half percent in 2020. What would happen to your mortgage payment if the interest rate were to suddenly go up to 8%? You think you might have a little trouble staying in your house? The average contract interest rate for 30-year fixed rate mortgages with conforming loan balances increased to 7.53%. That's up from 7.41%. Applications to refinance a home loan dropped 7% for the week and were 11% lower than the same week a year ago. And applications for a mortgage to purchase a home fell by 6% for the week and were 22% lower than the same week a year ago. The demand for mortgages is down by 22% in a year and home prices still haven't moved. They're going to start moving eventually, guys. And when they start moving, look out below. Mortgage rates just continue to climb higher, taking a particularly big leap. As a result, total, total mortgage demand fell by 6% 6 compared to the previous week. That's according to the Mortgage Bankers Association Seasonally Adjusted Index. Now, this paragraph jumped out at me because this is another warning sign, another big red flag for me. The purchase market slowed to the lowest level of activity since 1995 as the rapid rise in rates pushed an increasing number of potential home buyers out of the market. Now, he also noted that adjustable rate mortgage applications or ARMS increased. The ARM made up 8% of purchase applications, and that's up from just 6.7% a month ago when interest rates were slightly lower. ARMS offer lower rates, but are fixed for a shorter term, usually five or 10 years. And guys, if you don't already know, adjustable rate mortgages were a big factor in the global financial crisis. A lot of people took out these mortgages that come in, they start off with very low interest rates. And then when those introductory rates expire, the interest rate on those mortgages adjusts to the prevailing market rate, which usually means they go much, much higher. So the fact that adjustable rate mortgages are on the rise tells me a lot of home buyers are betting that the Fed is going to ride to the rescue. They're taking out big mortgages on homes they probably can't afford, and they're betting their financial survival that the Fed is going to lower rates. That may not be a safe assumption. This is risk piling up in the mortgage market. Speaking of the mortgage market, check this one out. Why 8% mortgage rates aren't crazy. With fewer buyers for mortgage bonds, the rates on home loans can go unusually high. Treasury yields are jumping higher, but even that doesn't explain how high mortgage rates are getting. Home buyers might wonder whether typical mortgage rates could soon hit 8%. I would be amazed if they didn't. Historically, the answer might have been that this was unlikely without a dramatic change in Treasury yields. Even 10-year yields going to 5% from 4.8 wouldn't have implied mortgage rates at that level. That's because what it costs to borrow to buy a home usually hews fairly close to 10-year Treasury yields. But the answer in today's market they might very well get there. One big reason is a change in who is buying government-backed bonds that pool many home loans into investments. 
which in turn drives the market price of a standard mortgage. For years, the Federal Reserve or the big banks, and often both, were significant and somewhat indiscriminate buyers. They're talking about buyers of mortgage-backed securities or mortgage bonds. Now that isn't the case. The Fed is trying to shrink its balance sheet, and banks are working to overcome the effects of rising interest rates. In the first half of 2023, banks and the Fed collectively reduced their portfolios of so-called agency mortgage-backed securities by about $207 billion, according to figures compiled by strategists at Bank of America. So what we're talking about here, guys, is there's just not such an appetite for mortgage-backed securities anymore for mortgage bonds. Now, when you take out a mortgage from the bank, typically the bank doesn't sit around and wait 30 years for you to pay them back. The bank take those loans, they put them into a bucket, they call it a mortgage bond, and then they sell that mortgage bond to pension funds, to other banks, to anybody who will buy it, including the Federal Reserve a few years ago. But the Fed and most of the banks are now net sellers of mortgage bonds, which means there's not so much appetite. So the banks aren't able to so easily take those mortgages that they issue and just sell them off to investors, which means banks are being more careful who they lend money to, which means they're driving interest rates higher. And so the spread between the 10-year yield and what a typical mortgage is, is starting to grow as it's getting harder and harder for the banks to offload those mortgage-backed securities. And again, guys, you're not going to want to miss this talk with Kirian Von Hess later today. He has found something. I think it's amazing what he found in the mortgage market, in the market for mortgage-backed securities. And the fact that nobody is talking about it is very suspicious because this is a big freaking deal. And it's just amazing that he found this information. We will have that one up later today. You are not going to want to miss it. And check this one out. Japan keeps yen traders guessing over whether it intervened. Officials declined to say if it stepped into the market to prop up the yen. Japan's currency surged after crossing the 150 mark against the dollar. Japanese officials are sticking with their strategic silence on currency intervention as speculation swirls over whether the government acted to prop up the yen. This was yesterday. There was a big move. The yen strengthened significantly in a span of just a couple of seconds yesterday. The finance minister, the top currency official, and the government's chief spokesman all said Wednesday that they wouldn't comment on whether Japan intervened. Among other possible explanations for the sharp market moves on Tuesday, a combination of jittery markets and trading algorithms responding to the yen slide through the key $150 per dollar threshold. Either way, the seed of doubt serves Japanese interests by keeping traders on edge. The Bank of Japan is not saying whether or not that was them yesterday making that big move in the yen. And this is the big move that I'm talking about here, guys. Check this out. It was right around 10 a.m. Eastern time yesterday. We saw the Japanese yen make a move higher. It broke out into that over, it broke above 150 yen to the dollar. If you've been following this channel for a while, you know I've been talking about how, hey, guys, at 150, that's when everybody expects the Bank of Japan to come in and start selling dollars to buy their own yen to prop up their, the value of the yen. And when you see this chart heading lower, that is the yen strengthening versus the dollar. So yesterday, right within minutes, right after we broke, let's zoom in on this so you can see it a little better. I want to show you guys just how quickly this happened yesterday. Within a few minutes, we break 150 at 10.03 a.m. yesterday. And then by 10.07 a.m., the yen starts to drop. By 10.12 a.m., it's dropping significantly. And then right here at 10.12 a.m., this is all Eastern time, at 10.12 a.m., the Japanese yen goes from 149.77 all the way down to 147.27, and then right back up to 148.85. That all happened in a span of 60 seconds. That is a massive move in the world's third, fourth, probably fourth largest currency. That doesn't happen organically. Something big happened during this minute. Now, the yen would settle here. It would bounce around a little bit more, and now it's staying right around 149, where it is this morning. Now, the Bank, Bank of Japan is not saying what happened here. My gut tells me this wasn't the Bank of Japan. Even though I was expecting the Bank of Japan to start acting at 150, I've seen this before if you've ever worked in a power plant or in any kind of industrial environment, there's this phenomenon called instrumentation hunting. When you've got, say, a pressure indicator that controls the position of a valve downstream in a piping system, there's a lag between 
when the pressure indicator reads a pressure and it sends a signal to the valve to open or close, changing the flow dynamics through the pipe, that changes the pressure, which makes the gauge react again, sending a different signal to the valve. And the two instruments tend to hunt each other until they reach an e equilibrium. I know that got a little technical, a little nerdy. I'm sorry, guys. But I've seen this happen before with piping systems. And what I think happened here is they triggered a trading algorithm because everybody was expecting the BOJ to act at 150. I think you probably had a lot of computer programs that were programmed to just say, okay, we're at 150, go ahead and sell. And then when that happened, it started this cascade of sales. All the algorithms started doing the same thing all at once. The system overreacted massively. Within a few seconds, it triggered the other algorithms that had buy orders placed in and brought it right back up, which would explain why there was this massive drop and then big instant correction. All right, so I don't know that for sure. That's me speculating, but this to me looks like software programs arm wrestling with each other, not like a central bank intervening. I think central banks are more slow and methodical when they intervene. I could be wrong about that one. Only time will tell. Uh, one more topic I want to talk about. Let me check my time here. How are we doing on time? All right, we got a few minutes. We can do this one. We have got WeWork, guys. Keep an eye on this one. WeWork shales fall 25% after the company skips interest payments. WeWork is basically a real estate investment trust. They're like the Uber of office space, I guess. You can temporarily rent a workspace. The company will use a grace period because they missed a payment on their bonds. So now they're into that 30-day grace period before they would default on that bonds. And the firm is in the process of renegotiating nearly all of its leases. WeWork shares slid 25% on Tuesday morning to their lowest price on record after the company skipped interest payments due on five of its bonds. The co-working firm withheld $37.3 million of cash and $57.9 million of in-kind payments on notes, according to a regulatory filing, kicking off a 30-day grace period before a default. It said it had enough liquidity to make the payments and may elect to do so in coming weeks. Well, isn't that nice of them? Oh, we've got the money. We're just not going to pay. Gee, thanks, WeWork. WeWork said it will use the grace period to negotiate with creditors and preserve cash. Well, if you want to negotiate with your creditors, maybe tell don't tell them we can afford to pay you. We just don't want to, but that's just my take. Last month, the struggling firm said it was renegotiating nearly all of its leases and earlier said there was substantial doubt about its ability to continue op operations. Guys, WeWork owns uh, 16.8 million square feet of office space, they either own or lease, I should say. They control or they occupy 16.8 million square feet of office space. That office space represents about $7.5 billion worth of CMBS loans, and about 38% of that is in New York. Now, if WeWork were to default on these loans, if they were to go out of business and they were to vacate all of that space, this would be a whole bunch of commercial real estate supply all coming on the market all at the same time. That's why you need to watch this story. This is another sign of the commercial real estate bubble popping in the United States. And one last one you guys want to keep an eye on is this one, another big strike. I'm not going to get too much into detail because of time here. Kaiser Workers launched largest healthcare strike in U.S. history. Long story short, guys, 75,000 workers are going on strike at Kaiser. This is another big labor dispute. The Fed is watching these stories. I guarantee you they're worried about wage spiral inflation. You can put this one on the pile. That includes the UAW strike, the UPS strike, all the airline strikes. Organized labor is demanding big wage increases. The Fed doesn't want them to get it, and they're using interest rate hikes to destroy the job market to prevent them from getting it. So this is another one that you got to keep an eye on. And I have to say thank you very much to Mr. Steve Woitis, who says 8% is a normal mortgage rate. Problem is, yes, Steve, decades of low rates have pushed home prices way too high. You're absolutely right. You know, go back to the 1980s, an 8% mortgage would have been a great deal. All right. The, the problem is we're not in the 1980s. You know, after decades of zero interest rate policy, which is the exception, not the rule, we've all been conditioned for these lower rates. But throughout most of history, interest rates have been higher than this. It's now that's the weird time. That's the awkward time. So this is really just a return to normal. Beware, all you guys out there signing up for adjustable rate mortgages, betting your financial future that the Fed is going to save your butt. Steve has got a great point here. 8% is the norm. 2.5% is bubble territory. And you're sitting there signing up for an adjustable rate mortgage, betting the Fed is going to bring back the bubble. That may not be a safe bet. Steve, absolutely, sir. Thank you for the support of the channel. Great comment. And I appreciate that very much. And thank you, Lance, for the super sticker. No comment from Lance. 
Uh, wait, hold on. Let's see. Did Lance's comment come up here? Mm, nope. Nope. Just being a swell guy. Thank you, Lance. I appreciate the super chat and the support of the channel, sir, very much. And I just want to say thank you, everybody, for spending your time with us this morning. Thank you to my Patreon supporters. Looking forward to talking to you guys at 3 p.m. Eastern time today on our weekly Zoom call. There is a link down below in the description should you feel so inclined. Keep an eye out for that interview with Kieran Von Hest about mortgage-backed securities. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. I love you guys. Till next time, live small and dream big. <laughs>